Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 550. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Congo. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's November the 15th, 2019. Okay, welcome to another program. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clerics and laity alike, we appreciate that you watch the program. I just realized I'm the only person today who's not on an island. <laughs> just just putting that out there, you know. <laughs> Although my vacation starts today. Before we get too far along, please like the program on YouTube or Facebook. Please share it with all your friends. Please go to the comments section either on Facebook or YouTube and uh, continue the conversation from the program you're watching. We really appreciate that. And subscribers, we're above 5,000, which, you know, if I were some uh, young teenager in Hollywood, I would want, you know, 25 million, but I think 5,000 Anglicans is pretty cool. So we really appreciate that. Keep up the, uh, the good work. If you're not subscribed, it's time to subscribe. You have no more excuses if you watch this program more than twice because you like us. We know you do. It's, it's true. Okay, uh, George, how is the Isle? I'm in the French West Indies on the Isle of St. Bartholomew. Is that uh -huh. how you pronounce it, Kev, Kev, Gavin? <clears throat> Saint George, Bartholomew. The secret is always to do it with enormous confidence so that yes. <laughs> whatever, whatever dialect you represent, you represent with, with professional enthusiasm and nobody can contradict you. It's, well, well, however, the... however you choose to pronounce it is the right way. Well, I'm on a little French, it's a little French, uh, Norman Village has somehow floated off to the West Indies, and I'm here for the next three weeks as a priest in charge of St. Bartholomew's Anglican Church, l'Église Anglicane, and I'm living in the Presbytère, uh, right on the right on the port side in the little town of Gustavia. Now, does the congregation mind that you're not French-speaking? No, because this is the English Church. Okay, the English Church. The, right. the, the congregation... St. Bartholomew is an unusual island because it's it's more like French Canada than the Caribbean. 80% uh, are native French Frenchmen, uh, transplants from Normandy about 200, 300 years ago when the French Canadians came to the New World. About 10, 15% are, are from the metropole, as they say, and then 5% are American and British and Canadian expats who own the great villas overlooking the ocean. And this is the church for the, the expats, and for the few West Indians from the islands who are working in the service industry. So it's quite an unusual congregation. Hmm. Uh, Gavin, you're in a new room. Oh, and so, I have oh, to yeah? say, Wait, hold on. Yes, sir? Uh, we actually, actually, the uh, I do, this is my first congregation with a real Russian oligarch <laughs> on the parish rolls. No. The man who owns, I think, the Chelsea United football team is a member of my parish and he's jewish too but nonetheless <laughs> he's counted on the parish list that's great wow gavin uh you look like you're in the oxford library or something whoa <laughs> well, are the I, books? Have, I have the house to myself today and this is the warmest room in the house <laughs> so um i've i've taken it over in a fit of patriarchal authoritarianism and <laughs> <laughs> and it just so happens that the bookcase isn't the warmest room, so I, I, that's why I'm here. That's fine. Yeah, you, anytime you can reclaim space from your wife, it's important. <clears throat> I say that because my wife's home from work today. We're starting our vacation, and uh, so we have an audience. We have to be careful what we say or we'll get comments. So just letting you know that up front. Uh, let's move on to some news and talk about uh, um, Justin Goes to Rome. Uh, <laughs> if you have if you paid any attention to uh page seven or eight of your local newspaper or the last thing they show on the news on the bbc uh it's not trump it's not uh brexit it's that uh justin went to rome and uh he had an opportunity to bring any anglican with him or any uh certainly person from England with him and he chose somebody that I thought was an odd choice or maybe a cunning choice and I thought we, we could discuss who he brought with him and what she represents uh, to Anglicanism and maybe to the future Catholic Church. So let's start in. Uh, I have trouble with the pronunciation. Gavin, who did Justin take to Rome with him? Pachamama. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 
So there is a there is a, a very nice woman called Jane Ozan who was a a single evangelical Anglican for much of her life and uh, discovered that uh, her real happiness lay in being a lesbian. And because she's a woman of enormous competence and 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 evangelical fervor, has put all her fervor into the promotion of of Christian lesbianism. And uh, one of the things she's done is to conduct a campaign trying to ban conversion therapy. That is to outlaw anybody who wants to pray with someone who has unwanted or d distorted sexual desire, uh, or if you are what or you or we are those people uh, to, to ban prayer at either end. Now, um, she's been on the Archbishop's Council, but I understand she's just lost her place in an election. Uh, Welby has been to Rome and there have been a few pictures put out um, by Anglicans showing how well they get on together and how much they love each other, which is jolly good. Um, but it turns out that in his entourage is Jane Ozan, and Jane has managed to get herself photographed talking through an interpreter to the Pope, to showing him her new book and asking for his support. Um, she didn't get any support from him, it, it, but, but the, a picture speaks a thousand words. I think the issue is really, if you want to know what Justin Welby's priorities are and what's on his heart, then, then look at the company he keeps and the people to whom he provides the real platforms for meeting the Pope. So we don't believe in guilt by association, but it is extraordinary that he should choose to uh, promote Jane Ozan and um, to make sure that she has this photo opportunity with the Pope to further her ends to make praying for transformation, for holiness, and for freedom, illegal. Hmm. That's George, cunning or stupid, or um, he's well on the way to uh, making Anglicanism into Roman Catholicism, while the Pope is making Roman Catholicism into Anglicanism. Yeah. I feel very conflicted about talking about this topic because it involves my making a value judgment about another person. Uh, I don't know. I cannot read Justin Welby's mind. Uh, I am good enough at what I do to be able to sort of divine where people are going and what they're thinking by their actions and by their statements. But with Justin Welby, I come away with either the man is very, very dumb or he's very, very clever. Uh, Gavin has actually provided this answer which is that he's very, very cunning. Um, Justin Welby is such a disappointment on so many levels because he has not stood fast for Christian truth. He's not stood fast for the church. He is, um, if you will, the main, main engine at this point, pushing for the acculturation of the church into the world and bringing, in other words, it was bringing Jan, bringing Mrs. Ms. Sozan to Rome speaks symbolically to the left in England, that this is someone who has my approval such that I'm going to bring them with me to visit the Pope. And at the same time, the Archbishop of Canterbury is talking to the Global South leaders and saying, trust me, uh, we'd, I personally am opposed to uh, the gay movement, but I must work within the environment that I'm in. Just trust me, I've got a cunning plan. And what is so distressing is that there are some people, some church leaders in the developing world who are so, in such desperate straits, economically or politically, that they subsume the, the, the truth of the faith because they need the archbishop's political clout in the councils of power in London or the world. And to me, that's just so, so disappointing and disagreeable. And I, I actually feel badly because here I'm making a value judgment about a person who I think is actually doing evil in the world. Yet I don't really want to do that because it's unkind and unfair. Well, one of the issues I have is it makes people who've uh, gone through conversion therapy and have been healed and the people who've been prayed for and been healed, second-class citizens within the mm -hmm. church. Uh, you're not allowed to raise your voice and well, it, it worked for me. I was prayed for and delivered. I have uh, at least two dozen friends on Facebook who've uh, gone through experiences of prayer or conversion therapy who uh, are completely delivered. Uh, and, you know, they have no voice in the church. And I think what I, I, go ahead. What, what I find difficult about the idea of 
conversion therapy in the way we're talking about it is yeah. that we're somehow restricting it to homosexual desire. Yeah, sure. and the fact that we, we, I like the phrase disordered affection because we all suffer from disordered affection and we all need prayer for it and we all need healing. Uh, and, and there is, if you like, a sliding scale between, between rampant, disordered heterosexuality at one end and whatever you find at the other. Uh, but, but we all depend on, on prayer for conversion and therapy. Conversion and therapy are two good Christian words which also stand together. The reason I was slightly rude about Jane Ozan and calling her Welby's Pachamama is because she seems in the same way that, that the Pachamama idol from the South South America seemed to represent um, a, a pagan fertility symbol which pagan culture in South America is in touch with. It's almost as if Jane Ozan represents a pagan infertility symbol. So that, that, that within the homosexual culture that's sweeping the West, uh, the, she, she's become almost a totem, a religious totem to invoke infertility in our culture. Uh, over and against authentic Christianity. Uh, and again, I, I just find it incredibly difficult that, that she should be one of the people at the heart of Welby's entourage, whom he provides with a platform for publicity in order to outlaw prayer for conversion and therapy that all Christians need, whatever our disorder. Well, Celebrate Recovery, uh, AAR, conversion therapies they're taking you from one state to another state and um you know i i can't see a church getting on with miss ozan's uh agenda the way the church of england seems to have adopted it it what what is so that many of our viewers write and say well you you take great delight in telling us all the bad things that are happening what are the good things that are happening um, and on this particular issue of standing against the culture, standing against the world, being a voice for truth against the powers and principalities, both uh, spiritual and uh, political, we see that in the Anglican world. We just saw that this past few weeks in Chile and in Bolivia, where Bishop uh, Raphael Samuel of Bolivia and Bishop Tito Zavala and his other bishops in Chile have, in midst of horrific civil and social unrest have been consistent voices for the gospel. And here we have Justin Welby, where they're actually not people in the streets yet, but even before the people turn into the streets, Justin Welby has surrendered to the other side. Whereas these South American bishops have stood fast for what is eternal, not what is expedient. And it's there, are other, there are many, yeah. many other Anglican leaders like that. But what is so discouraging is that in the United States and in England and Hong in Canada Kong. and in Hong Kong, we have leaders who value property, who value status, who value social prestige over the eternal truths of the gospel. Now, one of the, you know, in trying to categorize Justin Welby, which I did unsuccessfully, I have to say that it, we, it's been a funny thing, but Pope Benedict XVI and Rowan Williams were perfectly matched for each other. They were both great intellects. They were both great theologians, and they actually were able to work well together because their minds worked together on the same wavelength. Francis works very well with Justin Welby mm -hmm. because his devious, I'm going to upset people, Jesuitical mind works well with Justin Just Welby's <laughs> political mind. Uh, both have an extreme level of cunning to achieve their desired ends. Uh, and basically, it's a match made in heaven, or actually match made in hell. For the, well, one thing they're doing, is, and I'm not certain if uh, it's good or bad yet, they're going to go to the South Sudan and promote peace and flowers and whatever else Let's, they can you know. Well, see, the thing is, on, on one level, now we're getting to the Anglican weeds. Yep. South Sudan is a basket case. It needs international support. It has an it ongoing tribal civil war between the Noor and the Dinka. After having overthrown the Muslims in Khartoum for 35, 40 years since independence in 54, they finally have their own country. Now that country has fallen apart in tribal warfare with the two principal tribes and the other tribes sort of going from side to side. 
It's a terrible situation and the church is dirt poor, but it's growing and it is thriving. People are coming to Jesus Christ in the middle of tremendous suffering. Last time the Pope went there, uh, no, I'm sorry, he, the Pope had the leaders of the various factions up That's to right. Rome mm -hmm. and the Pope kissed their feet. And here we have Justin Welby. So whatever's going to happen, I can tell you the Pope will upstage Justin Welby. Justin Welby will look well, rather I, silly. But actually what will happen? Nothing. Nothing will happen other than expectations raised, but no, because the, the, the answers Welby wants to offer and the Pope wants to offer are political and economic, whereas the answer that South Sudan needs, which is a Christian nation, is faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the Church of South Sudan is preaching, but they're not going to get that when they have just a well become to town. At, at the Sudanese bishops are meeting right now, when we had the ordinate, where they had the consecration of the last primate, Justin Badi Arama, they had uh, Josiah Wadawa Faron, the Anglican Consultative Council, or ACC leader, come down from London to give a speech because they need that Canterbury connection. Adawa Faron, in his speech, cited the Quran. These are bishops who have fought a civil war for 30 years with the Muslim government in Khartoum, and the man from London is reading to them texts of the Quran to help en enrich them. Can, to me, there is no other greater statement of the vacuity or the evil of what is coming out of the institutions of the West. Well, that's what I want to talk about here as we finish up, and that's called street cred. Um, for the longest time, Global South and other leaders in the Anglican Church and outside the Anglican Church have always uh, appealed to Rome because uh, appealed to Rome and appealed to uh, Lambeth because it came with street cred. By the way, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the See of Canterbury, the Office of Canterbury supports what we're doing. That is street cred, and I think we're getting to the point now where. Um, Rome and Welby and Canterbury have lost the street cred. Gavin? Well, it depends what criteria you use. If, if you use the criteria of the New Testament and the apostolic tradition and holiness, then then um, Canterbury certainly has. I, I was I was very upset when when I was sent recently an interview with Justin Welby supporting buffer zones around abortion clinics. The idea that any Christian leader could uh, not only support uh, abortion, but actually support the state's attempt to criminalize people who wanted to pray uh, and to demonstrate. It, it's just, it's just, you know, George may have difficulty sometimes because he's a very generous man in attributing spiritual worth or, or, or blame but i have no difficulty at all on this case i once i saw what abortion was the 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 deliberate child sacrificing to a to to a, to a different god uh, in in numbers that that make you weep and your hair fall out uh, the idea that a christian leader could support either abortion or the criminalization of people against it is is, is impossible to me so yes i think that on matters that really are important canterbury has has lost all um, biblical and traditional moral moral um, virtue, but uh, if you live in the world, if you live in the, in, in the political world, if you uh, want to achieve your aims by some kind of leverage, then yes, no doubt his links with the foreign office can be very helpful. But once again, Christians are always invited to choose between whether we live in the kingdom and in the world of the spirit or in the world of politics and the flesh. And the real problem with all national churches uh, is that they are, have this huge temptation to live lives of political quest in the flesh. That seems to me to be exactly what the Church of England is doing. I agree. Now, have we covered all today's topics? People have been we freaked out. To we... On, we wanted to touch on uh, Canada briefly. Yeah, People well... also want to know what the background music <laughs> is today, George. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, George, you've been playing the the radio loud, or there's a, a marching band behind you playing French uh, uh, music? No, we have uh, little houses in France, in the French West Indies, mm -hmm. and uh, the in back of the presbytere is the uh, is a uh, 
the home of a local artiste, and uh, the artiste is uh, artiste doing his morning exercises. <laughs> <laughs> He's artiste. Some of us do calisthenics. He does rock. He does uh... <laughs> rock paper scissors. No, yeah, sure. Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Canada. Um, for the longest time now, going on maybe six or seven years, they've refused to put out their statistics. Um, we've watched the Episcopal Church crash. We watched the Church of England crash. Uh, any uh, you know large denomination has seen their attendance go down significantly over the last twenty years, and so it's so bad in Canada. They just said we're not going to we're not going to let you know how bad it is. So people have been emailing us because there's been a, a more recent uh, report, and I thought George could bring us up to speed on that because you're working on a story. Yeah, I want to do an in-depth story, not just cut and paste what's been already been put out there. Mm -hmm. But the gist of it... Ten, ten seconds. My, my, my dog, who has a mind of her own, has decided to break down the back door. And, and if I... <laughs> Don't take care of the dog. George is going to talk about Canada. Okay, seconds. all right. Hang on. <laughs> so, George? The Anglican Church of Canada uh, uh, commissioned a statistical analysis of attendance patterns. And you're right, Kevin, they don't, uh, they don't collect data the way the Episcopal Church does. So part of it has been deliberate and part of it is uh, just, they're just not that well organized. What the statistical report delivered to the Council of General Synod stated was that by the year 2040, if demographic trends continue, the Church of Canada, Anglican Church of Canada will be extinct. That they're declining at such a rapid rate that the church has no future and this was presented to the bishops at the house of bishops meeting and the website anglican samizdat was able to publish a copy of that report but the report did not become official and public until this week's meeting of the council of general synod and what it's saying is that the number of the only thing that has increased in canada in the last 20 years is the number of clergy the number of people have declined 30 to 40 percent. Um, and the response, well, let's quickly say the response of the General Synod, Council of General Synod, which is, well, we need to continue what we're doing, but even more of it. We need to engage even more aggressively with social justice. And we, we need to be even more aggressive in celebrating the gay and lesbian community, because that is going to be our salvation. The author of the study noted that when he was in the church in the 60s, when it was full and expanding, you never once heard about social justice. You only heard about the gospel. But now this new church, you hear about social justice and the Indian reservations and all this and that. And do we really want to go back to a gospel-oriented church or do we want to go back to a social justice-oriented church? His response was social justice, as was the bishops. But I think I know what my response is. But he, here's the funny thing. Uh, I contacted the Anglican Network in Canada, which is A-N-I-C or ANIC. Mm -hmm. They have an average Sunday attendance of about 5,000. Wow, that's growing. Which makes them actually, if they were a, the diocese of the Anglican Church of Canada, be the second or third largest diocese, just behind Toronto mm -hmm. in terms of attendance. So, but it's not all people fleeing a, uh, the Anglican Church of Canada for ANIC that is causing their decline. People are just walking away because the church offers nothing to them. Their oh, product so. isn't selling. If I want to hear the gospel of climate change or the gospel of social justice or whatever the the, the latest uh, uh, gospel is, according to the Western uh, philosophers, I don't need to go to church to hear it. That's kind of a uh, something that that Facebook is for, and Twitter is for, and Instagram is for, uh, and your local news. I uh, don't need to go to church and sit down and have my, my priest tell me about it. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't go to that church. They, I mean, the Diocese of Toronto, which is the largest diocese, has has uh, five bishops, I believe, for only about 20,000 people on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, my diocese may not have 20,000, but close to it, we've got one bishop. Um, Canada, for some reason, ha is overmanned has too many dioceses, too many bishops, too many clergy for the number of people it actually serves. So it's not because they have a lack of actually trained people, it's but the trained people they have don't seem to be doing what is necessary. So we need to talk about tomorrow a little bit 
you may see George's picture on Instagram. You know, when people are the Paris match or... Uh... <laughs> So uh, we, we need to let you know that George is part of a service tomorrow being thrown at his church. Uh, can you give us a quick uh, update on that? Well, I did a rehearsal last night for the wedding of uh, wedding on Saturday mm -hmm. of uh, two people. And she is a model for Victoria's Secret. And she has 1.7 million followers on Instagram. We get excited when three to 4,000 people watch our show. <laughs> she has 1.7 million people. <laughs> And the uh, church, it's an invitation only wedding and they have 250 guests and they've taken over several hotels, booked them entirely. They've taken over the church and uh, we're expecting paparazzi. Uh, and so the gendarmerie are going to be outside the gates checking passes and uh, going to be quite a show. Uh, our version, our French Caribbean version of a royal wedding. And, but here's a funny thing, if I may. I did a, in France, you, you have a civil wedding. And then if you like, you have a religious wedding, but a religious wedding has no legal standing uh, because of the separation of church and state in France for the last 125 years. So I, they've had their counseling. Uh, they're both Roman Catholics that live in the United States. They wanted to have a wedding in this church because it's a, an exotic destination that is rather fashionable among, among the, uh, the jet set but I sat down with I talked to them and here are two people who our culture would say are the epitome of materialism uh, you know you could call them you know shallow clothes horses but that would so far understate who they are because as I'm talking to them I'm hearing a deep yearning and hunger for the eternal for the divine and they're asking me intelligent questions about Jesus Christ this is not this is the See, the Episcopal Church and Justin Welby and the Anglican Church of Canada are sh chasing after the shallowness, the materialism, the political correctness, whereas the people with the very pinnacle of this are turning their thoughts inward, tell me about Jesus. And to me, that's it's so exciting. For my children, it's exciting because daddy's going to be on Instagram. <laughs> For me, it's exciting because God is working in ways that you know, the world can't, can't really imagine. It's such a joy. I, I'm ter terrified. I shouldn't really. That's wonderful. We should end there, really. But 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 I'm going to spoil it. By saying, no, go for it. <laughs> no, I, I, just, I think George is a new is a new George, is a new Michael Curry. Um, yes, I can't. I can't wait for the sermon tomorrow. <laughs> and um, I, one of the things that's happening in England at the moment uh, is that Meghan Markle and um, Prince Harry have decided not to spend Christmas with the Queen. I saw and that. They, and I was terrified. Well, the papers are saying this is rather sad because this could be Prince Philip's last Christmas on Earth. He's really very elderly. And and wouldn't the loving thing be for them to prioritize uh, just doing the normal thing and, and being with the grandparents for Christmas? And I, it took me back to Michael Curry's sermon, which was so applauded. And it was all about it was all about love. But 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 at a point when it really matters. Which is the love of the family and and, and respect and, and honor and self sacrifice. Um, Curry's message on love didn't strike deep enough into this poor couple's heart to help them choose to do the right thing at a highly symbolic and really important moment in the life of the nation at Christmas and of the royal family. And I, I think George, you know, talk about the love of Jesus to convert and to transform people, and and you may give these people a chance in their married life. Talk about love in the way that curry did and uh, it may be water off a duck's back and not much help to them well i think we've seen and what a wonderful sermon and dynamic dramatic sermon curry gave that was the beatles love yeah that wasn't the love of christ that was the love of of four men from liverpool and uh it was a much different uh, uh sermon than i would expect from a leader of a church Well, well yeah, I've, got that is a new I've got seven. I've got seven <laughs> minutes, so uh, okay, we got to go. <laughs> thank you for the advice. I should rewrite my sermon. Uh, but no, if, if we do get Harry and Megan here on Saturday, I'll let you know. Uh, please shake hands, say hi from Anglican TV and from Gavin. Uh, you know, we, we appreciate that. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger.
I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 550 of Anglican Unscripted. That's assuming that YouTube allow this to be broadcast in case the music playing in the background breaks their it's copyright. It's copyright, that's right. <laughs> I'll get another email. Yeah, we, we now have French theme music. I appreciate that, George.